This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is Ole Miss Athletics Director Ross Bjork. On March 21st of this year, Ross Bjork was announced as just the seventh full-time athletics director in Ole Miss history, and at age 39 became the youngest AD among BCS schools. For the previous three years, Bjork was the director of intercollegiate athletics at Western Kentucky, helping lead the Hilltoppers to continued growth and success in the Sunbelt Conference. At the time of his hire at WKU, Bjork was the youngest athletics director of all the 120 FBS programs. And before accepting the post at Western Kentucky, Bjork had extensive work in fundraising and external affairs at UCLA, Miami, and Missouri. In other words, the now 40-year-old Bjork may be young numerically, but his impressive resume and experience in the field made him a very attractive get for Ole Miss and a popular choice to lead Rebels athletics into the future. But as anyone with knowledge of a job of this stature will tell you, it's not all fun and games and Bjork has already had to make some major decisions. Today, the highs, the lows, and everything in between as we talk Ole Miss Athletics with Ross Bjork, next on Sports Files. Ross, thank you so much for taking the trip up from Oxford to be with us here in Memphis. Always great to be in Memphis and joining you on the set for the first time. The Glad search committee, here. thank you so much. The search committee was two people, the COO of FedEx, who we know very well, Mike Glenn, and Archie Manning, the former Ole Miss star. Mm -hmm. And they came up with a bunch of names, and they finally realized the guy to take them forward, to take Ole Miss athletics into the future, was yourself, Ross Bjork. So we had a chance to talk to Mike Glenn, and to get some comments about that decision. And I want you to react to it after we okay. see this clip with Great. Mike Glenn. Okay. Ross Bjork is, is uh, cut out of the mold. If you, if you said, I want to go to Central Casting and I want an AD, right. and I want to look at his, his resume and say, so give me a resume that fits all these things, fundraising, understanding of social media, alumni relations, all the issues that go along with it, and then I want a guy at a Central Casting to fit that role, they'd send Ross to you. Your reaction? Well, it's very flattering, you know, coming from a guy who runs, you know, helps run one of the largest companies and most successful companies in the world in, in Mike Lynn and FedEx. And, and when they called me about the Ole Miss job, you know, I didn't really know much about it. But when I found out that Mike and Archie were involved, I said, OK, this this is something different. This is something more unique than just a normal athletic director search. And so it, it really piqued my interest down the stretch to be involved in the Ole Miss job. And then once I met Mike, and obviously meeting Archie, and I've met Archie along the way, but mm -hmm. meeting him in this, in this setting, I said, okay, this is different. They're committed to being successful at Ole Miss. And so it became a no-brainer to you, join up. And you quickly realized how important FedEx, we already know how important it is to Memphis. You realized how important FedEx, this company, is to Ole Miss. No question. You know, we're an hour away. You know, so the partnership that's been developed over the years has been tremendous. And having Mike as an alumnus, Mike's been tailgating on campus since he was five years old. Wow. And he's tailgating about 40 feet from where he started tailgating as a five-year-old. So <laughs> obviously his love for Ole Miss is deep. And so to have him so committed to what we're doing at the institution and then in athletics, we have the FedEx Academic su Support Center right. on campus. So right. they've al already made investments into our program and, and we hope that'll continue and know it will with Mike's leadership and developing a relationship with Mr. Smith and all the people at FedEx that mean so much to the university. Ross, how important is the city of Memphis and the metropolitan area to Ole Miss? You know, I've really, since I've been here, tried to grasp, you know, a, a full understanding of this city and what it means to our institution. It's an hour away. It's the largest, closest city to Oxford. 
And so to me, we need to wrap our arms around this city from a student recruitment perspective, from an alumni engagement perspective, to a recruiting of student athlete perspective, to playing games up here. We signed the deal, the four-year deal with uh, Memphis in, in basketball and football. To me, it's important that we're here as many times as possible getting that exposure and capturing not only Ole Miss fans, but also college football, college basketball, sports fans in general, because SEC athletics is at the highest level, and we're an hour away. And so why not capture this market? So I think it's very important that we, we really drive a stake here in the city of Memphis and be here as much as possible. Not only is it your first year on the job, it's Hugh Freeze's first year on the job as the head football coach. Tough one last weekend against Vanderbilt. Two games remaining. You need one more win to become bowl eligible. I think, at least personally, mm -hmm. even if you come up a little short, this has been a very good season, I believe. I think this team has done things uh, pretty well, and I don't know what the expectations were, but I know they weren't that high. Well, I think, you know, Coach talked about it. You know, in the spring, we went on this Rebel Road trip and went all over the state and all over the region, and we talked about the expectations being that we compete for 60 minutes and then see what happens on the scoreboard. And I think people have really understood what we inherited, what Coach inherited specifically with the football program, that right now we're playing with 59 scholarship student athletes mm -hmm. and you're allowed 85 and so we're short we're thin but the guys have bought in the guys have bought into a cultural change in our program meaning we have to do the little things in order to win those games and we are so close to turning that corner you know a m game the vanderbilt game you know those are frustrating because we we were ahead and had a lead and so the expectations grow but we love that we love the fact that people are upset that we're five and five knowing that we, were had a, we had a tough road ahead right, when, when the season right. started. And so I love what our coaches are doing. I love what they're doing in recruiting. I love what they're doing in our locker room, what they're doing on the field. To me, the sky's the limit with this program as we build facilities, as we continue to recruit at the highest level, as we continue to get our fans to, to buy in. I love what's happening with Coach Freeze and, and changing the culture and mindset of how we do things. You play in, in such a tough conference, uh, and for many, including myself, and I'm sure yourself as well, believe it's the toughest conference. Mm -hmm. So what does that do for scheduling your non-conference opponents? I know some games have already been scheduled prior to your uh, arrival right. in Oxford, but now you're working on future schedules. What's your philosophy? The philosophy is, is we want to be as competitive as possible, you know, in the national landscape, knowing that we play in the toughest league, in the toughest division right now in college football. Right. We hope we have a chance to play for a national title this year, the SEC meaning, if Alabama can, can get back up there with some help, you know, around the country. But our philosophy will be that we want to be smart in the region. So who do we play in the region? So the Memphis series to us made sense to schedule that. Also Tulane, our fans love going to New Orleans. It's an easy trip for a lot of people. So we like playing the Tulane series. And then after that, we want to have three non-conference games at home. And so what does that look like? Is that a Texas big time series? Is that a, a buy game, meaning we're buying somebody to come to our place, Louisiana Lafayette, Troy, Idaho, you know, programs like that. Our philosophy is as we build the program, we need to be and want to be 4-0 as we build the program. And then you go into the conference schedule saying, okay, we've got four at home and four on the road in the toughest league in the nation. So we want to have a balanced, competitive, really regional non-conference schedule with the best competitive chance to, to win. I know you're trying to set an attendance record this year. 401K is the, right. is the motto around campus. Uh, and you're trying to get there with one more home game. And that's, of course, the Egg Bowl. Right. So in a couple of weeks, you want that place jammed with Ole Miss fans. Absolutely. Our, our charge has been the best game day atmosphere in all of college athletics. So when, when people walk in our stadium, our ushers, our ticket takers are saying, welcome to Ole Miss. Thank you for coming. And then when they leave, please come back. So we put out this, this challenge to our fans and really to our staff to say, why not set the record? Why not set the record to show that this program can do it and also show support of our team and our coaches. So the Mississippi State game has to be above capacity to get to our 401k. So we might have some standing room only that we squeeze in there. And we hope it's a great atmosphere. If we don't hit 401k this year, I believe we'll be in second place all time, which again makes a great statement that our mm -hmm. fans are buying in, that the culture is changing, and that we're putting on a, a game day atmosphere that's uh, second to none in college football. Ross, there was an incident on election night and uh 
some feel it was blown out of proportion, a, a couple of kids getting carried away. But from a perception standpoint, how does it hurt you? And, and what would you say about that incident? What I would say is it, it's, a, it's unfortunate that one person or 20 people you know, decided to use language that is totally inappropriate and totally unacceptable for 2012 and for our campus. And so our, our chancellor, our student affairs division, they've taken action and they're looking into to what exactly happened. And so from that perspective, it's very micro. We're looking at exactly what was said, who said it, and why did they say it, and finding out the macro part of that. Then from a, from, excuse me, a micro part of that. Then right. from a macro perspective, you know, it wasn't a riot. We know it wasn't a riot. There was no violence. There was no one hurt. Um, a few kids were arrested for public intoxication, but not because of the violence. So the, the media side, the social media side, started using the word riot, which was totally um, inappropriate and overblown. And so our stance has been if one person uses inappropriate racial language, it's wrong. And so how do we overcome that? We know that's part of our, our history. In the state of Mississippi, we always have to continue to learn from that. And what I told a group of recruits on Saturday when they were on our campus is don't let the outside world define who the University of Mississippi is and Ole Miss is. Come check it out for yourself. Ask a lot of questions. Talk to our student athletes about how they're treated on our campus. Talk to our students and really understand what goes on from a global perspective on our campus at the University of Mississippi and find out for yourself. Don't let a news clip or don't let somebody else define it for you. Come check us out and find out what we're all about and know that we're making strides every day and that we're not perfect. Society's not perfect, but we know that we're committed to doing the right things every single time. You've had to make some tough decisions already in your first year uh, in your new job. And one of those decisions was with the women's basketball coach and the two assistants who were all let go mm -hmm. and also a self-imposed one-year postseason ban. Right. Just talk briefly about having to make that tough decision. You know, you, you always want to go through that honeymoon stage without any right. sort of issues like this. But knowing college athletics, anything's possible. And so as we got more information, as the facts become, became more clear in the process, we decided to make that tough decision on our head coach. And Adrian is a great man. We know that we hired the right person when we saw the reaction of our student athletes. They were, they were very, very upset and very disturbed about what happened. And ultimately, they, they take the brunt of this and they had nothing to do with it. But the severity of the, of the nature of the findings, uh, of the violations that happened, um, the, the nature of the two individuals um, and what they did, we really had to take action at the highest level. And ultimate responsibility now that the NCAA is level, leveling presumed responsibility of the head coach, mm -hmm. we really used a filter that said, what should we have known? What could we have done to prevent this um, as a head basketball coach and as a campus? And we had to take that action. And so our job right now is to really wrap our arms around these young ladies and support them at the highest level, knowing it's a tough situation. And our job, hopefully, is to try to shrink, shrink our penalties into one year. And hopefully the NCAA agrees with those. We don't know that yet. We'll have to go through that process. But the idea is to put everything in a tight window and try to do it all this year. And then hopefully we go through the process with the NCAA and they say, you guys did a great job and, and we move on. Andy Kennedy and the men's basketball team off to a good mm -hmm. start. What is the timetable for the new arena? The new arena, we hope to break ground in late 2013. We're finalizing the exact location. I believe that we can have a great front door for Ole Miss athletics if football and basketball have a synergy together. And how that looks and how that's defined, we're in the process of making those decisions. So our goal is by the end of the calendar year is to have a decision on the exact location of the arena and then to really start the detailed planning behind how everything fits together. The Grove is special on a football game day. But when you walk towards a stadium, you kind of get lost in trees and wires and other buildings. There's no front door. And then on a Tuesday or a Wednesday afternoon when somebody wants to conduct business with our athletic program, they have to go to three or four different places. A different place for the team store, the ticket office, the development office. Right. We don't have a Hall of Fame. We want to put everything together so there's a front door to Ole Miss Athletics. So. How that comes together, we've taken a step back and said, what's the big picture plan to do this for the next 50 or 75 years? Not just put an arena down, open the doors, and say, let's play basketball. 
we need to do this in the global context of our campus master plan and a front door for athletics. So that's a long answer to say we hope to break ground by the late 2013 and be open by the uh, opening game of 2015-16 season. And of course, a big part of that and to do the things you want to do is fundraising. Give right. me a minute on that because I know you have an extensive background in being able to raise money for whatever institution you've worked for. Mike Glenn alluded to that in that opening clip, right. and, and I think that's what did make me attractive is I have experience in building buildings and raising money and doing the things that we need to do from a capital and, and fundraising standpoint. We've made great strides since I arrived and, and really looking at the philanthropic side of our campaign. We have a lot of proposals that are out there, a lot of discussions that are out there. We've hit the $75 million clip in our fundraising campaign. Our goal is $150 million. We hope after the first of the year, once we make that announcement on the location of the arena, we can accelerate some other gifts and really have a lot of momentum going into early 2013. So people are buying in every single day. We've got people out there making gifts and we hope to be well over 80 million after the first of the year. That'll allow us to break ground on the arena and then we'll continue to push. Our job's never finished. Fantastic. All right, we, we like to wrap up our interviews with a little fun thing. Okay. We call it Five okay. for the Road. This okay. is rapid fire question okay. and answer. Okay. First thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Favorite professional team? Chicago Bears. Are you from that area? No, Walter Payton. There you go. Sweetness. Loved him. Sweetness. Favorite, so favorite athlete, is it, is it Walter Payton? Walter Payton, George Brett, Michael Jordan. Kind of a tie there. Good choices. Good choices. Your favorite musician, group, music, what do you like to listen to or who? My wife and I love George Strait. So you're a big country fan? Country, yeah. A little bit of rock just and a roll, big George yeah. Strait fan, right? George Strait. But He's had a few yeah, hits, right? He's had a few hits, exactly. <laughs> Favorite television show? I don't know how much time you have to watch wow. TV, but... Favorite television show? What do you like? Seinfeld. It's a classic, right? Classic. I mean, you do, every time it comes on, you just can't help but just sit there and laugh <laughs> and, and go crazy. And it's Love on it. all the time, isn't yeah, absolutely. it? Absolutely. Okay, and we'll wrap it up with this. Your favorite movie? I'm wondering if it's a sports movie or is there something, some other genre that you like? You know, the, I, I watched, uh, when I was about 20, I watched One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and I love Jack Nicholson. So I think that's just a classic, you know, old school movie, and Jack Nicholson is just, he's terrific in that. So If, if my memory serves I me think, correctly. And I wasn't born, I think that was 1974, I think. Right, it was the early 70s. And I was born in 72, so. Had I to, hate, had I to, hate watch to say, I was born a lot earlier than that, <laughs> but you are the second guest, if my memory serves me yeah. correctly to say one flew over the cuckoo's okay. nest for okay. that answer. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, yeah. it's another it's classic. classic movie. Ross, thank you so much. Absolutely. An abs absolute thank pleasure. You, Greg. Continued thank success you. at Old Miss. Absolutely. We'll do and it. We'll take a quick break. Come back with our overtime segment right after this. Memphis in the Mid-South will never be mistaken for an ice hockey hotbed, but for the 21st straight season, the River Kings are lacing up the skates and providing exciting sports entertainment for local fans of the game. The Kings pride themselves on being the oldest continuously operating sports franchise in the metropolitan Memphis area. Now, this year marks the second season for the team in the Southern Professional Hockey League after 19 seasons in the Central Hockey League. And I recently spent some time on the ice with River Kings head coach, Derek Landmesser. Well, Mess, great start to the season for you guys. So what are the expectations this year? Uh, they're high. I mean, uh, last year was their first year in the, in the Southern Pro League, and uh, it was kind of a learning experience for myself. Um, but this year, the expectations are high. Uh, we expect to win every night, and uh, we want to bring the cup back here to, to the Mid-South. We'll test your skills, get a couple of wristers and slappers while we're talking to you. Yeah, it must have been a nice, uh, tough transition for you and for the players that were on the team last year going from the Central Hockey League to the Southern Professional Hockey League. What's the big difference? Uh, the big difference for us is uh, we're more of a developmental uh, league. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of younger players. Um, this year's team, we've got, uh, we've got 12 rookies on it. So normally in the Central League, you're looking at probably three to four rookies each year. Uh, we get 12 this year. 
Um, last year we had, I think it was eight or nine. So it's more of a developmental league. Um, but like I said, it, it's extremely good hockey. Uh, and I know our fans enjoy it and, and more people will come out and see it and they'll enjoy it as well. All right, Daryl Stoddard is your captain. That's a name very familiar to the River Kings organization. But throw out a few other names that people may need to get themselves quickly familiarized with when they come down to see the River Kings. I think, uh, you know, with Daryl being here his eighth season, uh, he's a familiar face in the community. Uh, but we have some other guys that played here last year. Um, you know, Kyle Lundale is one of our veteran defensemen. Um, Kevin Ficala is, uh, is more of a, is a tough guy enforcer. Uh, the fans love him, obviously. Uh, he does, he um, brings a lot to the table every night. Um, Matt Whitehead was another player that we had right. last year. We acquired right. halfway through the season. Um, he's a smaller guy, but I tell you what, he's, uh, he's electrifying out there, and the fans love him as well. And uh, our other returning player is David Wilson, the goaltender that we acquired early in the season, uh, who actually uh, stays here year-round. Year All right, Max, give me one in the upper right-hand corner. Upper right. Um, this was interesting for you in the summer. You reunited with your coach, Doug Shedden, and you came here back in 99. You've been here in the Memphis area in the Mid-South for a long time. Um, but you were with Doug at his training camp for the team he coaches in Switzerland. Tell us about that. Oh, it, it was awesome. Uh, you know, Shed's gave me a shout this this uh, summer and said, you know, what are you doing in August? Uh, you got some free time to come out and work our training camp in Switzerland. So uh, I thought the, the opportunity was is, was fantastic. Uh, I took him up on it. I went over to Switzerland and worked his training camp with him for a week and a half. And, you know, it was a tremendous learning experience for me to reunite with Doug. Uh, and steal some tricks from him. Uh, it was awesome, and just just to be there and to catch up with him was uh, was a fantastic learning experience for myself. What is the big difference with the young guys now? As you said, they're, they're learning, they're trying to move up in the ranks in hockey with these these players developing these players. What's really the the one area that they need to work on most of all in the game of hockey to better themselves? A lot of it for the younger guys is experience. Um, you know, they come out here and some of the guys go 200 miles an hour everywhere. Uh, you see as veteran players, more experienced guys, they learn the game a little bit more and maybe they don't go as fast, they're a little bit smarter. So it's, it's education of the game. Um, the young players need the experience and, and the pro game to the junior game or the college game is a lot different when you're playing a 56 game schedule over, you know, a, let's say a 25 game right, schedule right. In, in college. So. All right, hit the pipe if you can. I'm saying you can hit the pipe, yeah. Um, Look at that, man. <laughs> <laughs> right on cue. What's the fan support? I know that Lander Center has been uh, a great destination for hockey fans because you don't get a lot of that in the South. But what's it been like? I know you have your core fans. And, and what would you say to people right now? They're like, well, oh, hockey, I don't know. I, I'm not used to – what would you say to entice them to come here and, and watch the River Kings play? You know, I, I just say give it a chance. Uh, a lot of, a lot of our, our loyal fans have been loyal to us for a long time. And for the new fans that come out, a lot of them don't understand the game of hockey. But right. I tell you what, hockey, hockey fans are, are great people. And if you sit beside someone and, you know, maybe pick their brain and ask them in the crowd, uh, you know, they'll be more than happy to help you out and, and tell you a few tips about the game. But uh, the facility here is fantastic. It's the nicest one in the league, hands down. And like I said, uh, once the fans come out and they actually learn a little bit about our game, uh, they get hooked pretty quick. And at least you're not affected by this NHL work stoppage. It's, it's terrible. They're playing hockey here uh, in DeSoto County. That's great. But what's the latest with the NHL? Will we have a season? You know, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a, it's a dark area, and I, I'm not sure if there's going to be a season or not. Um, you know, we do benefit, I think, a little bit from it because of uh, all the players that can possibly play in the American Hockey League. They're being pushed down there, and then there's a big push down all the way down to our level. So the talent level at our league is, is a lot higher than it has been. Right. And uh, like I said, I, I just encourage the fans to come out and check it out. It's, it's, uh, it's a real fast, high-tempo game, and they'll enjoy themselves. All right, again, you said uh, last year learning curve in the league for the first time, the Southern Professional Hockey League. You said you want to bring a cup back. I mean, do you really feel that you have the talent out there that could – compete and, and eventually bring home the cup this year? Without a doubt. I think this year we've got a real special group of guys talking to some of the veteran guys we have in the locker room and, you know, the bond that the guys have, have got early. Um, you know, they said that, you know, we've got a great group of guys and all the talent levels through the roof. And, uh, you know, we got the toughness and the, and the stuff that's going to, you know, help provide the entertainment. Um, but like I said, I, I really truly believe we have a real special group of guys and, you know, we're going to continue to get better every day and every week. And, and like I said, ultimately our goal is to bring that cup back here. All right, give me upper left here. This guy can still shoot, folks. <laughs> Close enough, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Mess, thank you so much. A pleasure. Best of luck to you guys this year. Thank you very Good much. We see. appreciate it. As we leave you today, some sad news to pass along. 
Earlier this week, the Memphis Grizzlies family suffered another loss away from the court. Assistant General Manager Kenny Williamson passed away at the age of 65 after a battle with cancer. Just last month, the Grizzlies said goodbye to their vice president of basketball operations, Dana Davis, who passed suddenly at the age of 56. Known affectionately as Eggman, Williamson was hired by the Grizzlies in the summer of 2007 after stints in Charlotte and New York. For 35 years, Williamson worked as a coach, scout, and executive at all levels of basketball. He is a native New Yorker and was a fixture watching games at the popular Rucker Park in Harlem. Our thoughts and prayers here at Sports Files goes out to Kenny's family and friends and the entire Grizzlies organization. And that'll do it for this week. Have a very happy Thanksgiving, and I'll see you again the day after for another edition of Sports Files.